In this chapter, we will explore some of the legalities involved with funding an EMS agency. When completed with this module, you should be able to develop a conceptual understanding of the federal anti-kickback statute as it relates to Medicare Medicaid billing. Identify business practices that could potentially place an EMS organization in violation of the federal anti-kickback statute. Define whistleblower protection, identify the many areas within EMS where a whistleblower may have protections, and analyze best practices for an EMS organization to handle these issues. Identify the various methods of fee-for-service arrangements and identify pros and cons of each type of arrangement. Describe the special issues associated with an EMS service that is a not-for-profit organization under the IRS code, and analyze the role of an EMS organization in grant writing and grant acceptance. So what would you do? You work as an EMS provider for a private EMS agency and have responded to Mrs. Jones numerous times. A frequent user of EMS services, Mrs. Jones typically requires help back into her bed or, based on medical need, transport to a local hospital for treatment. Mrs. Jones is generally unhealthy and takes numerous medications for her many health issues. Although you are not responsible for billing activities with your service, Mrs. Jones asks you one day to take a look at a recent bill for services from your ambulance company. When you look at the bill, you notice charges on the bill for services you did not perform and equipment you did not use, such as the use of oxygen, IV supplies, two medications, and excessive mileage. After the run, you return to the station to review the documentation from the call in question and confirm that she was billed for services and a transport that never occurred. As an employee of the service, what are your options in this situation? What would be your best course of action? Hopefully you will be able to answer those questions once completed with this module. To introduce this topic on funding, it is important to recognize that many EMS agencies bill for their services. Some EMS agencies may be solely tax supported, but that is not necessarily common with services funded through a combination of property taxes and fee-for-service billing. For services that employ a fee-for-service model, it is imperative that those responsible for managing those services understand the rules of creating a bill and the collection of fees, especially when that billing involves Medicare or Medicaid. While it should go without saying that all EMS agencies should be ethically motivated to not commit fraudulent acts in the collection of fees, that is unfortunately not always the case. The anti-kickback statute states it is illegal to offer, pay, solicit, or receive remuneration in exchange for referring an individual or furnishing or arranging for a good or service for which payment may be made under Medicare or Medicaid. In 1977, the statute expanded the language to prohibit solicitation, offer, payment, or receive any remuneration. The new language upgraded the crime to a felony, punishable by up to five years' imprisonment and or a $25,000 fine. Penalties for violating the federal anti-kickback statute are significant. If convicted of such a violation, the convicted entity is excluded from participating in federal health care programs. If the guilty party is an individual, that person may be excluded from federal health care programs. The government may also assess civil monetary penalties, including damages. While the federal anti-kickback statute does not create a private right of action, meaning an individual cannot directly or personally sue the entity violating the statute, the False Claims Act does allow for a private party to bring a quitom action in which the private citizen sues on behalf of the federal government. If successful, the individual who brought the lawsuit against the accused party actually receives a percentage of the recovery, which could provide a significant incentive for a private party to pursue such an action. Originally enacted in 1972, the anti-kickback statute was designed to protect both patients and the federal government from fraud and abuse. The law has been updated and modified numerous times, with notable changes made through both the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 and the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. The good news for medical providers is that the Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General has been given authority by Congress to adopt safe harbors to protect specifically identified business and financial practices from criminal and civil prosecution, provided they fall within parameters defined to minimize the risk for potential corruption.
Thus, not all financial activities between independent parties is automatically in violation of the anti-kickback statute. Routine practices such as investment interests, space rental, equipment rental, referral services, warranties, discounts, and group purchasing organizations fall under the safe harbor provisions of law. Beyond these exceptions, however, if the primary purpose of a business arrangement is a violation of the statute, a crime may still have been committed. This can apply in numerous situations, such as a hospital or health organization offering incentive payments to ambulance services or providers who have discretion in where to transport a patient to entice them to choose their hospital instead of another one. This could potentially apply to a private ambulance service competitively bidding for a municipal contract to provide services that offers to share revenue with the municipality in exchange for the contract, or a service that tries to generate business from a local nursing home by rewarding nursing home staff for referrals. Beyond these somewhat shady business practices, the law also recognizes other types of health care fraud on the back end, so to speak. This primarily involves billing of Medicare or Medicaid for services. One of the first problems is the delivery of care that is not medically necessary. To be medically necessary, the use of other methods of transportation are contraindicated by the individual's medical condition, and the individual's medical condition must warrant the level of service that was provided and subsequently billed. Any transport that fails to meet this medically necessary criterion is not a covered benefit and is not eligible for Medicare reimbursement. Thus, billing Medicare for transports in violation of this requirement constitutes fraud. Unfortunately, this type of fraud is not unheard of. Billing for unnecessary transports or upcoding the level of ambulance transport provided are common problems. Just because there is a paramedic on the ambulance does not necessarily mean the transport should be billed at the ALS level. ALS interventions must have been performed, and those interventions must have been medically necessary. Additional examples of fraudulent activity includes billing for supplies or services that were not actually used or rendered. More directly related to an illegal kickback are instances in which an ambulance service enters into a contract with facilities that provide large volumes of ambulance transport referrals at a below market rate for the purposes of then billing Medicare for services. The False Claims Act is related to the anti-kickback statute in that it establishes the protocol for whistleblower lawsuits and provides a mechanism to reward the whistleblower if the claim is eventually substantiated. The scary thing for medical providers is that all cases are filed under seal, which prevents disclosure of the claim to anyone other than the government prosecutors and the court. The case is investigated without the service having any notice or idea that it is under scrutiny. Once the government's investigation is complete, it has the option to either join, intervene in the case, or to not join. If the government does not intervene, that does not kill the case. Rather, the individual may still proceed with the aforementioned Quitom case. Without the government's involvement, Quitom claims are usually not as successful, but that does not mean the provider should ignore or not worry about those claims because the penalties, if substantiated, are just as severe. Under a Quitom action, the whistleblower is essentially suing the medical provider on behalf of the government to recover the funds paid by the government to the service in violation of the statute. If the case is successful, the whistleblower earns a percentage of the government's recovery, which can provide a significant incentive for whistleblowers to proceed with such a case. Whistleblowers also have considerable protection under the False Claims Act in that their identities are confidential until the seal is lifted on the case. Once that occurs, the individual is still protected against retaliation by the service named in the lawsuit. At this point, the seasoned EMS manager may have questions as it is not uncommon for healthcare facilities to ask ambulances for discounts based upon frequent or routine use of an EMS agency's services. The obvious concern is that such discounts may subject the service to liability under the anti-kickback statute and the substantiality and excess rule which will be discussed momentarily. Again, the anti-kickback statute is designed to eliminate situations in which a healthcare provider will offer a hospital or nursing home facility a discounted price on facility responsible transports 
based on an understanding that, as a condition of receiving the discount, the hospital or facility will utilize the ambulance service provider for all of its full fee federal program or Medicare transports. That is not to say that a discount can never be offered on services, but the ambulance service provider must be able to show that the price offered is based upon fair market value. The statute also prohibits healthcare facilities from soliciting discounts, gifts, or anything of value for referrals of federal program business. Remember that ambulance service providers or other health care providers who knowingly or willfully violate this statute are subject to jail sentences of up to five years and fines of up to $25,000. Given that the application of the anti-kickback statute and potential safe harbors are very factually dependent, services should seek the advice of an attorney when considering or developing any type of arrangement with other entities involving federal medical programs, including Medicare and Medicaid. The anti-kickback statute also has a substantiality and excess rule that was drafted to ensure Medicare does not pay significantly higher prices than other payers for the same goods and services. If the price charged to Medicare for services exceeds the average charge that the ambulance service provider billed to all other similar customers, that is a problem in violation of this rule. If a negotiated rate with major third-party payers is consistently below the Medicare rate, for instance, an obvious issue exists. Entities in violation of the substantiality and excess rule can be sued for civil penalties and barred from participation in federal programs. As mentioned previously, for those who report instances of fraud and violations of the anti-kickback statute, their identity remains confidential until the seal is lifted on the case. Whistleblowers, once identified, are also protected against retaliation by the False Claims Act. If the person reporting the problem is an employee of the agency involved, any attempts to discharge, demote, harass, or otherwise discriminate against the employee based upon the employee's reporting can result in a civil lawsuit against the agency for any damages suffered by the employee as a result of those illegal retaliatory actions. Shifting gears from the federal anti-kickback statute, our funding discussion will now look at fee-for-service arrangements in which EMS agencies charge user fees for the services provided. Medical costs are expensive and there are many people who historically could not afford medical care, treatment, or insurance. Many health care providers are now looking to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and Medicare reimbursements as a method to ensure they receive payment for medical care services. Many hospitals are also developing networks of primary care providers and specialists to be used as a referral network and the concept of community EMS providers is emerging as well to reduce the financial and resource burden on the healthcare system in general. Along these lines, even public, tax-supported EMS services have been charging for EMS services similar to private sector agencies. This includes billing the individual patient, the patient's medical insurance company, Medicare, or even all three. Aside from public and private EMS providers, many hospitals also provide transport services to fill gaps that exist in their local community, typically because there is no other agency, private or public, that can maintain the income necessary to properly staff and manage an ambulance service. While the cost of providing this service frequently exceeds the revenue generated, the hospital typically still generates adequate revenue to support the ambulance service given the fees billed by the subsequent emergency room visit. Some areas and communities may utilize a public-private partnership model where each involved entity provides some form of support for the ambulance service through staffing, equipment, or funding. Fee-for-service arrangements, while popular, do not come without some negatives to consider. The first issue is one of funding. In any business, including a fee-for-service ambulance company, a robust revenue stream is required to ensure continued viability of the service. Medicare only funds a portion of actual costs associated with ambulance transports, and collection rates against private individuals is typically low. The public may like fee-for-service models as it reduces the overall tax burden if the system is able to generate a certain level of revenue. On the other hand, some users of the system are not happy to receive a bill for services received from a tax-supported agency. Budgeting can also be challenging if the revenue stream fluctuates, requiring greater subsidy from the taxpayers to maintain services. Despite these challenges, EMS providers have been somewhat creative in surviving through challenging economic times while maintaining services. 
As included within the textbook, some of the solutions employed include ambulance member programs, insurance programs, private pay arrangements, EMS taxing districts, and even charitable care. How an EMS agency is formed can also impact potential revenue streams. Nonprofit corporations, for instance, enjoy tax exempt status because they work toward the public good and are not in business to generate profits for individuals associated with the organization. A very popular type of nonprofit corporation is the 501c3, named after the applicable IRS code, in which the corporation is not only tax exempt, but it is also considered a charitable organization. This helps generate revenue through private donations, which are then tax deductible for the person making the donation. To qualify as a 501c3 corporation, the nonprofit entity must engage in religious, charitable, scientific, educational, or literary endeavors for the benefit of the public. Given these activities, many foundations, social welfare organizations, and professional or trade associations often seek 501c3 classification. As far as EMS agencies are concerned, the IRS has determined that providing fire, rescue, or emergency services for the general community may accomplish charitable purposes under Internal Revenue Code 501c3 because such services provide relief to the poor and distress or lessen the burdens of government. In most states, if a nonprofit qualifies for a federal tax exemption, it will also automatically qualify for a state tax exemption as well. Another benefit for nonprofits is that they are eligible for public and private grants typically not available to for-profit entities. Nonprofits can also receive contributions from individuals, which may be tax deductible for those individuals if the nonprofit is also considered to be a charitable organization under the IRS code. Nonprofits typically enjoy protection from personal liability for directors, officers, and members. This means that if the nonprofit loses a lawsuit and the award of damages exceeds the amount of money the nonprofit has, that is the extent of the recovery available to the successful plaintiff. The directors, officers, or members are not personally liable for those damages. This liability protection does come with limits, however, as there is no protection for intentional torts, fraudulent actions, or reckless behavior that causes harm. There are legal steps that must be followed to become a nonprofit entity, which includes the creation of bylaws, selection of a board of directors, and the requirement to hold board meetings on a regular basis as defined by the laws in the state. Nonprofits must follow the guidelines set up for corporations. They must keep corporate records, prepare minutes of meetings, and maintain a bank account separate from those who participate in the operation of the nonprofit entity. The IRS Code establishes different mechanisms for creating and maintaining a nonprofit organization. For charitable nonprofit corporations, the applicable IRS Code is 501c3. As a part of this code, the charitable organization cannot be involved in political lobbying or political action. Nonprofit entities enjoy several benefits, such as an exemption from paying federal and state taxes and an eligibility for certain state and federal grants not available to for profit entities. Nonprofits can receive donations, and assuming the nonprofit is a charitable organization, those making donations can claim a tax deduction for the donation. As mentioned previously, board members are shielded from responsibility for corporate debts and liabilities, and nonprofits may still offer medical and pension benefits to employees. With all that being said, a tremendous amount of paperwork is required to obtain a nonprofit status through a lengthy application process. Strict compliance with all regulatory mandates is a must. Directors of the nonprofit organization cannot be paid for their time or services. The entity cannot participate in political action, generally speaking, and the financial records of the organization must be available and open to the public. Despite these disadvantages, it is often worth the effort to obtain a nonprofit status as the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. While tax exempt status can definitely save an organization money, the ability to seek grant funding is another significant benefit when considering funding streams. In simple terms, a grant is a request for funds that entails a description of a specific need and a proposed program that will fill that need. Grants can be a source of money for new programs, stabilizing existing programs, or expanding the scope of services already provided. When requesting a grant, it is important to carefully research the mission of and areas of interest for the granting agency, along with the grant guidelines themselves. 
writing for and managing grants can be time-consuming and detail-oriented. Before investing a great deal of time and effort, it is important to ensure the goals of the EMS agency align with those of the grant issuing organization. While obtaining grant funding is great in and of itself, being a grant applicant or more specifically a grant winner comes with a certain amount of political influence in the region depending on the nature and scope of the grant. Involving other individuals within the agency and the grant writing process also provides them with greater insight into the agency's financial status, which can be beneficial for strategic planning purposes. Given the information within this chapter, now reflect on the scenario presented at the start of this presentation. As a provider who discovered potential fraudulent activity, there is the option to do nothing about it. Ethically, however, that is probably not the best course of action and you should really report the findings to the agency for corrections. After all, the incorrect bill may simply have been in error. If the issue is not resolved, however, or it is apparent that this is a pattern of behavior as opposed to a simple one-time error, it would probably be prudent to report the incident to the Office of the Inspector General with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for further investigation. While one would hope a report would be made because it is simply the right and ethical thing to do, your reporting of these fraudulent charges could result in a reward of $1,000 or 10% of the funds recovered, whichever is less. If it is confirmed that fraud has been occurring, your reporting of the occurrences not only protects those being fraudulently billed, but the taxpayers supporting Medicare as well, both now and in the future. In summary, violations of the federal anti-kickback statute can lead to significant fines and possible jail time for defrauding the government. Violations include charging for services not rendered and supplies not used, upcharging for higher levels of care not medically necessary, and inappropriate business relationships that impact payments from Medicare or Medicaid. Those who report such fraud are protected by federal law and may be rewarded if the claim is substantiated. For those services formed as nonprofit entities, it is important to follow all IRS rules governing such an organization. Lastly, when considering funding mechanisms for EMS agencies, do not forget about grant opportunities, especially if the agency is a nonprofit.